Michelle, you mind doing a quick uh, sound check for me, please? Testing one, two. Perfect. All right, so let's get the party started. This is our last presentation. Thank you all for hanging in there with us. It's a very exciting one, and we actually will end early. Uh, at, I expect this uh, presentation to be about an hour long. And it's about complex mechanical losses. If you don't mind advancing the screen, Michelle. So uh, I'd like to introduce to you, Michelle Bradley. I'm sure many of you know her. She's one of our most senior mechanical engineers. Uh, uh, she has over 15 years of industry experience and has conducted over 2,000 forensic investigations. Her specialties include vehicle fire investigations, uh, failure analysis, product liability claims, residential and commercial appliances, equipment malfunctions in sprinkler systems, and heating and refrigeration equipment. I'm mm -hmm. sure it's worth noting that she that uh, she focuses heavily on mechanical related losses. All right, Michelle, the floor is yours. Thanks, George. Hi, everybody. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Uh, as George said, I, um, I do mechanical investigations for origin and cause, and uh, this coming March will be my 20th anniversary. I'm pretty excited. Um, I'm going to explain to you guys a little bit about uh, complex mechanical claims. Um, move something here. There. Um, so, in terms of mechanical losses, without getting into materials fracture analysis, it can either be something as simple as a piece of equipment, for example, a sump pump. Uh, it can be a little bit more complex with several systems, such as a vehicle, or it can be, for example, an entire assembly line, um, maybe at a factory or uh, if, uh, if an item or a component has moving parts, then it will have different components that we would utilize uh, to have those parts move smoothly and without friction, it, sometimes those parts can fail. Also, you can potentially have um, electrical systems involved with mechanical systems. And so they could be electrically energized as well. And I'm going to go over a few different case studies that will show you guys in a little bit uh, some different mechanical claims that we have investigated in the past. Um, they don't necessarily all have to be vehicles, just so you are aware of that. So here is, uh, for example, a vehicle. And what I'm showing you guys here is just a bit of an understanding when it comes to how intricate and detailed vehicles in this case can be. So if you look at the top left corner of the screen, all that you see in red here, these are all the wiring harnesses throughout one vehicle. So as I'm sure you've heard before by different presenters, part of what we're trying to always determine when it comes to fires is the area of origin first. You don't start investigating a fire looking for your causes. You need to try and determine an area of origin first. It's origin and then your cause. So for example, if we suspected that there was some kind of an electrical failure, which I don't get into great detail in this presentation, I really did focus just on mechanical failures. Um, there, I'm not going to be able to examine and go throughout an entire vehicle and look at all of these wiring harnesses. I would need to have an idea as to background information, discovery, service history. I get into that in a minute. Um, but it's really important when it comes to the electrical system of a vehicle to 
have a really good knowledge and understanding. Now, there are some great systems that we use, computer systems, that will provide us some of this information now. Uh, the industry's come a long way in the last 10 or 15 years. So now we can log in and we can actually find wiring diagrams and routing diagrams of different wiring harnesses, which will tell us uh, information that years ago we had to beg dealers to try and give us. In the bottom left-hand corner, this is an exhaust system showing right from the exhaust manifold where it connects to the engine underneath, um, going along the catalytic converter to the resonator and all the way back to the muffler. Uh, the reason we're showing you this is because another way that um, in vehicle fires that an ignition sequence can begin is if you have a flammable liquid that has escaped from where it's supposed to be and now is uh, forming a vapor cloud it can be ignited by a hot surface. And for example, you have hot surfaces in the engine compartment that run from the very front all the way to the rear of the vehicle. Uh, over in the right-hand corner or on the right side of the screen, you will see that we have the fuel lines. So I'm sure that um, some of you are aware there are certain steps of an investigation that can be completed during a preliminary examination. And there are certain steps that cannot be completed until the proper parties have been invited to attend. And those, those parties would be civilly interested parties, such as, hey, if a dealer just did work on a fuel system, and then as soon as the owner of the vehicle drives away and within 10 kilometers, the driver smells fuel and then has an engine compartment fire, I can't go and do a preliminary examination and just start willy-nilly tearing the engine apart and start pressurizing fuel rails and connections. I would need to make sure that the client invited all interested parties to attend so that we can discover the answer together at the same time. So a complex mechanical claim, um, we... It can, it always starts out where we go and we will perform a preliminary investigation first. I'll go, I'll take a look, I'll try and determine, okay, how bad is the fire damage? Um, is this going to be more complex than uh, perhaps just something that I can try and figure out during a preliminary examination? Do I need to involve and uh, have other parties present? Do I need to maybe have uh, sometimes there are mobile mechanics that I can use that have power tools that I don't carry in my car. They'll have compressors and they'll have uh, cranes so that they can lift and position um, equipment for me so that we can access certain areas that need to be accessed. <clears throat> I will usually try at the very beginning to determine the physical evidence and can I preserve it or retain it at the beginning so that we can invite all the other people or parties to be present? Uh, can I just examine it there? Will it be fine? Does it need to be moved? Um, using the scientific method, when we're conducting investigation, we form hypotheses and we have to gather all of our data first. We're trying to figure out the area of origin. And we'll use, we'll hypothesize different areas of origin, for example, taking into account fuel loads with vehicles and equipment. If they're outside, we'll take into account wind speed and direction. How was the fire being pushed by the wind and how strongly was the wind pushing the fire? And we hypothesize and try and figure out first the origin. And then we use the scientific method as well and try and determine the cause. Um, once we are able to work through our hypotheses, if we're, if we're lucky and the evidence is good and we've got really excellent background information and I have a good team of people with me, we are able to reach a final conclusion and determine a cause as opposed to having more than one possible cause and therefore an undetermined uh, conclusion. So mechanical systems 
often, as you're aware, are three-dimensional. And sometimes it's very difficult to document everything at the very beginning. For example, when I showed you that uh, the previous slide here, I couldn't have examined the fuel rail unless I had removed the intake off top. At the beginning of our investigations, one of the first things I will do is I will contact the client and I will either send an email or have a discussion and just say, I need as much of the following that you can possibly give me. So witness statements, I want discovery information. Who was there? What happened just prior to the incident occurring? What did they see? Did they smell anything? Did they hear anything? Um, fire department and police reports often are extremely helpful. I do ask for the recent service work so that we can determine, for example, um, if, if perhaps the vehicle wasn't being driven at the time and it had been parked for an extended period of time, it's either going to be, generally speaking, one of two possible causes. It's going to be electrical uh, in nature or it's gonna be an intentionally set fire. If I know that there has been some recent service work involving the electrical system, we can try and identify then parties that would want to come out and take a look at the same time. Um, vehicle performance prior to the fire is extremely important. So was there a lack of power? Were they pressing the accelerator and they, they noticed that the vehicle wasn't responding the way it normally does? Were they having electrical issues? Were they having multiple electrical issues? For example, you know, geez, sometimes my interior light would work and sometimes it wouldn't. And then I tried to roll down my window and that wouldn't work either. So we need that kind of background information. Also, I, I will always ask for the VIN, the vehicle identification number. Uh, and that's so that we can pull recalls, published recalls, either through Transport Canada, through the US version of Transport Canada, which is NHTSA, and then I can also do some research using Mitchell One and All Data, and I can pull technical, technical service bulletins or technical support bulletins. And those are usually <clears throat> not fire causing. If it's fire causing and been established, manufacturers are usually, I would say 95% of the time, uh, very interested in getting anything that's fire causing to a recall and not holding it up as a technical service bulletin for an extended period of time. I'll also request a Carfax if my client has pulled a Carfax or permission to pull a Carfax myself because I want the accident history. Was this an engine compartment fire? And had this vehicle nine months ago been in a fairly serious front end collision, then been repaired out on the road, and it turned out that maybe something wasn't caught. Also, the Carfax will also provide us uh, information pertaining sometimes to different servicing, uh, for example, that a previous owner might have had, um, if there were previous owners, if there were other accidents that we're unaware of, and uh, maybe where some of that servicing was done. I'd spoken a little bit about wind speed and direction. So if any of you have ever sat around a campfire or, um, if you have ever been sitting around a campfire and embers have ignited dry grass around you, that if you have a strong wind, you can actually watch how quickly and ferociously a, a good strong wind will push a fire in a direction. That same, the same wind and the same concept applies with a vehicle fire or equipment fire, something that's outside where you can have a fire start in an area of origin, but if you have a fairly strong wind that's pushing on that origin, you will only get fire spread instead of symmetrically around the origin, you will get fire spread only in one direction. So it's important for us to know wind speed and direction, but then I would also need to know the vehicle's orientation. You can't just tell me it was on highway 401 at a particular time. I would need to know where on 401 and I would need to know the direction it was facing. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about ignition sources before I get into uh, the next slide is case studies. And that'll be a little bit more interesting, a lot more photographs. So ignition sources typically with, um, uh, with mechanical uh, losses, equipment, appliances, 
uh, electrical failures we're looking for. Uh, we're looking for examples or evidence of leaking fluid, which could be ignited by sparks or a hot surface. I'm looking for evidence of a mechanical failure. So a mechanical failure that might create friction or heat. I've got a good example of that in a little bit, a wheel end fire. Um, or a mechanical failure that might result in fluid release and therefore ignition. Other ignition sources, uh, sometimes careless smoking might be something. Um, depending on the circumstances, I'm, I'm sure that some of you are aware at least, but years and years ago, a cigarette that is a cigarette or a cigarette heater that is improperly disposed of within a vehicle will not ignite upholstery and foam cushioning or carpet in a vehicle. It is treated with uh, flame retardant or uh, other chemicals so that you can't get a cigarette now that if you flick it out the front window and it comes in the back, it will ignite, for example, wadded up uh, garbage, for example, from Tim Hortons. Some people have their, their back seat, for example, full of garbage. I have had fires before where improperly discarded smokers materials have ignited uh, garbage in the back, but generally speaking, it will not ignite any part of a car. Uh, and then open flame incendiaries. And I, I don't go into any case studies that are, that is a completely different presentation. This presentation is geared primarily toward mechanical failures with um, vehicles and equipment. So I'm gonna tell you a story. This is, um, this first one is a very, popular vehicle in North America. It's a Dodge Ram Eco Diesel that had a recall uh, and it spanned from 2013, I think it's up to 18, possibly 19, um, where they have discovered that the EGR cooler as part of the EGR system is suffering some leaks from thermal fatigue. The cooler will expand and contract most of you know that metal will expand when heated, and then as it cools down, it contracts. So sometimes what's happened over a period of time is that uh, very small cracks will be created due to the thermal expansion of the EGR coolers. Now, here's an example of a vehicle that was being driven at the time. And eco diesel fires, if it is related to the EGR cooler, the vehicle must be um, in operation at the time. It's, it doesn't catch on fire if it's parked. So this fire in particular, the owner was driving the vehicle uh, and he was driving it on the highway. He was going rather fast. He was going probably hundred kilometers an hour. He heard a loud pop coming from the engine. He pulled over onto the shoulder and he didn't see anything wrong in the engine. And that's, right there, my first clue, because where the fire ignites, you can't see it. If you're staring right at the engine and the hood is open, you can't see where the fire is happening. It's actually occurring inside the intake manifold. He got back in the vehicle and he started driving. He continued to drive to the next exit and um, he exited and he did notice that he, had, he was experiencing a loss of power, which isn't shown on the screen, but I remember speaking with him and he said, you know, it was kind of weird. I, I wasn't, I would press on the accelerator and it just kind of felt like the vehicle was bogging down a little bit. So after he exited the highway and he was uh, driving for a short period of time, he was alerted to the fire by someone who was in a vehicle beside him who said, you can't see that there's a fire, but there's a fire that um, the person beside him was able to see. Now here is inside the engine compartment. There is not a lot of fire damage in this. I use this example on purpose because it had very little fire damage. On the underside of the hood, so the hood's been flipped up onto the windshield and you can see that at the, at the base, so right in this area, as reflected on the underside of the hood, there's um, a distinct fire pattern right there. And 
underneath this area is where the intake manifold is and the fire originates inside the intake manifold. This is my EGR assembly that goes from here to here. And this small section right here is the actual EGR cooler. I'm telling you this because if I go and do a prelim, a preliminary examination on a vehicle like this, I'm going to document a lot of my systems. I'm gonna take a look at the electrical system. I'm gonna document any arcing that I might have. I'm gonna take a look and see if I have any evidence of maybe head gaskets leaking, any other fluid leak, any staining on the exhaust, indicating maybe something leaked on the exhaust and ignited. But I can't complete my investigation uh, into a fire that might be related to the EGR cooler during a preliminary examination. I have to invite the manufacturer of the vehicle. And occasionally, I also have to invite the dealer depending on the work that was completed. For me to remove this and pressure test it is the only way for us to determine whether there is in fact a failure or a leak of the EGR cooler. So during the joint, uh, the joint destructive examination, and when I say destructive, I mean that I am, I'm not tearing things apart to be destructive, but I am altering evidence. I am destroying the integrity of the post-fire evidence as it was and altering it. So now in this photograph, you can see that I've removed the entire EGR system. So here is a blowout showing the entire EGR system, but, it, and, and it goes from here all the way to here. But the section that I'm interested in is just here. This is the actual cooler. So the exhaust is flowing through this and you can see two ports on the side, which when they're installed, they're actually facing downward. But this, here's another port right here and this port right here. That is the inlet and outlet of the coolant. So it's an EGR cooler. It's taking uh, coolant from the engine, from the, from the coolant system, and it's routed it through this entire heat exchanger. So exhaust is running through and coolant is running through, but they are separated from each other. What happens during the failure of the EGR cooler is that the thermal fatigue causes coolant to leak out of its controlled system into the flow of the exhaust, which then goes directly into the intake manifold. So EGR stands for exhaust gas recirculation. An EGR system then, the system will blend some of the exhaust gas into the intake with fresh air and it keeps the exhaust gas within the target emission level. So here is a really great schematic that my colleague Matt found for me to include in this presentation. And here is the same heat exchanger that I was talking about. So I was explaining to you that coolant comes in and goes out and that's these ports right here. Here, down, this is in the, this is actually inside a cylinder. The exhaust comes out after uh, combustion has occurred within the cylinder. Part of it, as you see, is diverted. So that's normal exhaust that would go down, but part of the exhaust would be diverted up to the cooler. It would run through the cooler and be cooled down, where it then goes through the EGR control valve into the intake. This is the area where combustion will occur. So in this heat exchanger, that's where the very small thermal fatigue cracks will occur that allow coolant to enter into the intake manifold. So I'm going to just read the wording of the EGR uh, Transport Canada recall. And it says that thermal fatigue may cause the cooler to crack internally over time. An EGR cooler with an internal crack will introduce preheated 
vaporized coolant to the EGR system while the engine is running. In certain circumstances, this mixture interacts with other hydrocarbons and air in the system, potentially resulting in combustion within the intake manifold. This can lead to a vehicle fire. So as you can see, we've connected two hoses and I'm gonna pressurize the coolant line that runs through the cooler. At one end of these, um, there's two hoses. So at the end of this hose, I have a, a pressure gauge. The testing apparatus and the testing conditions that were determined by the manufacturers that we would use a pump. I just use a bicycle pump and we would get the pressure in the system up to 20 PSI and then we would submerse this cooler into a pail of water. So this, this tube will lead over to a pump where I will pump up this system right down to the pressure gauge. I will get it up to 20 PSI and submerse it in water. Now, my next slide is a, a video. What we're looking for when we submerse this cooler underwater is a tiny, not a tiny stream of bubbles, sorry, a stream of tiny bubbles, so little champagne bubbles. Um, unless the leak is terrible, in which case then we will get very large bubbles, but the tiny bubbles can be difficult to see. So this is the beginning. I haven't actually started the video yet. I'm not sure if it'll work. If it doesn't work, I'll, uh, I'm going to point out right here so that you can see. Right in this area, you can see tiny bubbles that are already escaping. So these, some of these larger bubbles are just as we submerse it, some air is trapped in there. And so we kind of have to tilt the cooler inside the water to make sure all those big bubbles come out. All right, so let's, uh, let's see if this works. Uh, I apologize if it's too loud. I don't think I have any um, control over that. Okay, there you go. Um, so this happened one time uh, and it only happened once because it'll never happen again. I had um, not, I, I had really great background information and discovery information on a particular EGR, uh, suspected EGR cooler fire or an eco diesel fire. And uh, so one time I had not gone to do a prelim first because we had such excellent background information. It had been withheld from the insurance company that the insured had gotten so irritated with the delay. The manufacturer had a very long delay in um, engineering and manufacturing the replacement parts for this EGR recall. And so you can acquire on the internet and through parts suppliers, an EGR delete kit. And this is not an OEM option. So the manufacturer of the vehicle does not support this EGR delete uh, kit. It, um, it removes the EGR system altogether. It increases the power in the vehicle and it increases emissions, unfortunately. Um, it actually uh, also can, if improperly installed or not completed properly, it is another possible failure mode if um, the one that I had done, it turned out that they had only partially completed the EGR delete, had not finished connecting the exhaust and the gentleman was driving his vehicle <clears throat> with the exhaust coming out of his exhaust manifolds and no exhaust system from that point toward the rear. It was in the bed of his pickup truck. Oh, let me see if there's anything else before I move on. Yes, I explained that uh, we can't do the entire process unless we're at a joint exam. Uh, just to, for any auto adjusters out there, I would recommend that you don't quickly pay out this vehicle fire and move on after the fact to get this investigated because what we have found in the past is that when we go to get information and uh, insureds have already been paid out. We have so many questions that we need to ask on these. So the sooner you can get an expert involved 
in the investigation on a vehicle fire, the better before you pay out because sometimes insureds, once they've been paid, they won't answer their phones or their emails anymore. And then we're missing a bunch of information, which sometimes will affect subrogative action at a later date. So this case study uh, is a wheel end fire and there are a lot of wheel end fires that occur. So um, a wheel end fire, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background. There are basically three different scenarios when a wheel end catches on fire. You can have, uh, so all of these, so there are two wheels on this side and on the same axle, two wheels on this side. If one of those tires loses pressure while this, v, while this trailer is being pulled down the road, it can create friction and you can get what's known as a tire fire where there's nothing wrong with the brakes, there's nothing wrong with the wheel bearing and the tire itself can actually um, burst into flame. So that's one possibility. The other possibility, uh, brakes and bearings. I'm going to show you guys some example of both brakes and bearings, because if we end up completing an investigation on a wheel end and it's determined that it's not the brakes and it's not the bearings, conclusively, we can then say, okay, well then it's most likely a tire fire. On this case study in particular, the truck was pulling the trailer at the time of the fire. The driver observed smoke out the driver's side window uh, at the trailer behind him. When the driver pulled over and got to the rear of the trailer, one wheel end was burning. So there are some things that we are able to see during a preliminary examination of a wheel end fire. And there are some things that we are unable to see. So I can't go to a wheel end fire and remove the wheel ends without the other parties potentially being invited. There are some things that I can do during a prelim, which might be able to help us eliminate either the brakes or the bearings. Uh, but we're able to do a, a full complete investigation on a wheel end if the wheel ends are removed and if all parties are present. So in this photograph on the left, this is a perfectly functioning wheel bearing. You can see that all of the roller bearings are spaced beautifully around the perimeter. And on this side, you can see that you have, so there's actually two different sets uh, of rollers, but uh, let me see, I just wanted to get my mouse moving. On this case, uh, on the right-hand side, you can actually see that, the, that the, the roller bearings, this is what they look like on the left, are so damaged that they are, have basically been smeared. So you're talking about hardened steel that has reached such elevated temperatures as to smear it like icing. So here, this is another example of uh, not a bearing now. Now we're gonna be looking at some brake pads. So again, the wheel has been removed and we're now looking at the brake pads. So on the left, these are fire damaged brake pads, but you don't see any evidence of high heat or excessive heat. And you don't see any evidence of cracking. The brake pads are in reasonably good condition. They have been attacked by fire. That's all. On the right-hand side, you can see that there is cracking that has occurred. If you compare this, these brake pads and the condition of these brake pads on the right-hand side compared to the brake pads on the left-hand side, the ones on the left look significantly in better condition than the ones on the right. There are also gouge marks where there, was, there were deep gouges along uh, the brake pads as they were pushing against the inside of the drum. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit while you're looking at this screen about tractor trailers and um, 
as you're driving, you know, I saw a movie when I was a kid and it showed this, um, it had this scary scene where a man was driving a truck down a mountain on a highway and something happened to the brake system and he was pushing on his brakes frantically trying to stop this gigantic vehicle coming down the side of a mountain. Well, you know, it was, it was a fairly steep grade and it stuck in my mind uh, as a kid when I was watching this movie that, it, you know, it was very, very terrifying just to watch. Now that does not happen in real life anymore. The brake pads, if you lose air pressure to a vehicle system, like a tractor trailer system, as soon as you lose air pressure, the brakes automatically engage. It's the air pressure that pulls the brake pads away from the inside of the drum. So if it's, it's the type of failure so that if it fails, it automatically engages the brakes so that the, the driver will of course feel it. So if he's driving down the road and he suddenly, he will notice a difference if he, he or she is pushing on the accelerator, driving along, going 90 kilometers an hour, and then suddenly the brake system has failed, he will be able to, he or she will be able to tell that there is a significant drag being experienced by the vehicle. Oh, now um, I talked about how the wheels had been removed. And so this is the inside of the drum that has been removed. So here you can just see that this is a, a fire damaged brake drum. There's no cracking. There's no evidence of excessive heat. Whereas on the right hand side, you can see that this is the inside of a brake drum and it has very deep scoring from the pads being in contact with it all the time. Uh, you can also see evidence of cracking. And this is all a result of uh, very excessive heat temperatures being uh, reached during a brake drag, and which of course is a friction fire. So during a preliminary examination, Sometimes we're, we're, there's quite a lot that we're able to do. We're not often able to finish an investigation on our own because there are things that would need to be done that would alter the evidence. And so we would have to invite other parties. And so typically on a, on a wheel and fire, before I even go and do a prelim, typically I'll ask my clients, can you do me a favor and pull the servicing? Let's take a look and see if it's been, when's the last time the brakes were serviced? When's the last time uh, the wheel bearing was changed, if at all? And uh, how many kilometers are on the trailer? Um, and uh, also about, you know, for example, if they had any problems with the tire, with tire pressures, especially at the particular wheel end of interest. So when we go, so, as you can see, the slack adjuster and the push rod, you can see in this particular diagram, this forms a 90 degree angle. So typically what we'll do during a prelim, and I'll show you on the next slide, is we'll measure that angle. We'll measure this angle at all the wheel ends, left and right at every axle. And then that will show us, for example, if one is significantly different than the others. Um, I don't think there's really, oh, slack adjuster. Slack adjuster will automatically adjust to keep uh, even brake applications as pads wear, but they do need to be set properly when they're installed or when the wheels are removed. So sometimes if it's a brake system failure, it could be a result of a manufacturing defect, but sometimes it could be a result of improper servicing. So here uh, is an example of measuring the slack adjuster angle and the push rod length. So here's the slack adjuster. And here's the push rod going in here. And so here, my colleague is measuring the angle. And here, my colleague is measuring the push rod length. And so this will be done at every single 
um, wheel end to establish a baseline. Uh, sometimes, um, like in this case, for example, we actually had found that during the manufacturing process, there was a bracket. Um, we determined that the bracket to secure the slack adjuster in position was installed upside down. And so it did not retain the slack adjuster. So it didn't operate properly. So for example, uh, so if you see this part, I'm going very slowly so that you can see where my mouse is, that U is being held. So here's the bracket, this is all one piece. So see, there's one bolt head here. There's another one that you can just see back in here. This entire rectangular piece that incorporates this was installed upside down. This U is supposed to be upside down inside this U. So in this particular case, all of the wheel ends had been installed incorrectly. I mean, sorry, all, all of these, uh, all of these parts on this entire trailer had been installed incorrectly. Um, let's see, now we're going to do an agricultural case study. Um, this is a good one. So here we have a combine that has suffered a fire. The combine was operating at the time of the fire. Uh, smoke and then fire were observed by the operator on the right side of the combine. The operator shut the combine down uh, and was unable to extinguish the fire. So here uh, you, can, you can see, for example, that the fire has spread. Um, you can see that there's a tremendous amount of fire damage on this side of the combine compared to really what was visible when you were taking a look at the front of it. There are multiple, multiple ignition sources. Now he did not indicate that he, there was nothing that he felt wrong with the engine. He didn't experience any lights that illuminated on the dash. Nothing seemed to be going wrong at all. And so he was able to tell that he saw fire somewhere down in this area and that was it. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna point right here uh, to this elevator. I'm gonna move over here. This is the same. That's the same part right there that I was just referring to. And now if you look right in here, so on the right hand side you can see this part. This is the part that's of interest, and this is the place of interest. And I'm going to show you over here. This is what we're looking at over here in the grand scheme of things and right in that area. So this is the bearing for the straw chopper. And this was identified as having a failure. Um, this, a bearing failure can never be a result of the fire. So the temperatures raised, uh, the temperatures reached, sorry, during a fire aren't high enough to smear hardened steel. So if we end up taking a look and determining, okay, you know, for this, this, for example, you can see that it's not centered inside this hole. Something's off. The alignment is off. That was our first clue to tell us that, you know, geez, there looks like there's going to be something going on right here. Looks like we have to take a look at the service history and um, uh, see if this was ever maintained or ever serviced. If not, then we also have to look at the recommended maintenance by the manufacturer to see, was it, was it not serviced and it was supposed to be serviced? And uh, we ended up finding out that no, no servicing had been required. Um, let me just move, oops. Just trying to move some things around so I can see everything. Okay, so here, uh, here, what we've done is so we've removed some items so that we could get right in there. And once it was removed, you can see that the roller, well, the bearing is no longer present. It's just once again, smeared metal in this area. Uh, some bearings are 
self-lubricated and some are not. Some bearings um, need to be greased every 30 hours. And uh, I know recently, one of the files that we had, it was, it was for the year that it was manufactured, the combine and for the particular bearing where the failure was identified, it, the bearing was supposed to be greased every 30 hours. The subsequent year, it, they had changed it to being greased every 10 hours. And this was the bearing that had failed. So it's interesting that as manufacturers get feedback from the field, from their dealers and from their service departments at their dealers, they'll actually find out, for example, that, hey, you know, greasing this every 30 hours really isn't working. We've really got to um, decrease the frequency so it's a, a faster frequency for, for greasing. So some equipment will have an onboard fire suppression system. Uh, sometimes the system will include a tank of suppressing agent that's piped to nozzles throughout the machine. Most often, this would be the engine compartment. Uh, sometimes it will be in where the hydraulics are, but not very often in the area where I was just showing you. The nozzles are typically uh, just always open so that if the suppression Aid, uh, if, if the suppression system is activated, the agent will be forced out of every nozzle. There are two methods of activation. Uh, sometimes there are temperature sensors in the engine compartment and a manual activation uh, sometimes is required and the switch would be in the cab. So on that previous example, not the fire suppression, but on the bearing example that we were looking at. This is an example of the parts of a combine and how much is involved, how many bearings there are, how many different parts there are for so many different systems. So it can become an extremely complex fire investigation. This blowout of the previous diagram, that was the one part that we ended up determining uh, that had failed. So in our breakout view, this uh, on one beater bar, it shows the bearing components for the one beater bar. Uh, the separator hours, so part of the combine has a separator. Uh, the separator hours are tracked on a combine and the total hours these components uh, would be running or documented. So we would need to examine the hours and the greasing procedure in comparison to the manufacturer's recommendations. Uh, we also have to take into account the grease amount, the type of grease, et cetera, because all of these details are important. For example, if they're using the wrong grease, that might have, a, that might have an impact on whether a bearing is able to withstand its normal lifespan and normal load conditions, or if it would fail prematurely. Uh, sometimes we have to analyze the bearing side versus the load and weight on it. Now, this is not a piece of equipment. This is a different kind of case study involving mechanical damage. And it's for a safe. So, this is uh, a file of mine from years ago. I was brought onto this particular file because um, one of my colleagues, Mazen, had been retained to investigate and assess the alarm system. This was an alleged break and enter at a home in the greater Toronto area. And so while Mazen was there uh, assessing the alarm system, he realized that the safe had been broken into. And so he asked the client if the client was interested in having the safe examined as well, just to see the, there's one thing in particular that I'll, I'll show you later that Mazen saw that he thought was kind of odd on the safe. And so he recommended that the safe be installed. So anyway, families away in Mexico on holidays, break and enter happens while they're gone. The alarm system was examined and I examined the safe. There was 
documented over $100,000 worth of family items stolen from the safe. Now, this is the locking mechanism on the actual safe. And you can see that the background information that we were provided is that the safe was in the locked position while the family was gone and that no one that remained in Canada had the combination to the safe. But here is, uh, here's the throw. As you can see, it is in perfect condition. There's no deformation to this material at all. And I'm just gonna go back. As you can see, so the safe door is off. Here's the safe, it is, um, there's the safe body that's installed inside the wall. And this kind of installation is, it's between two wall joists that you can't see. So here's one and here's another. And so you're able to just uh, insert it in between two studs in a wall. And then it, it sits very flush up against a wall. You can either have a picture in front of this or you can hide it behind clothes in the closet like these people did. The safe was removed and we ended up doing uh, an examination and investigation of the safe and the deformation to the different areas of the safe in our lab instead of in the home. We needed to retain it as evidence anyway. So uh, the upper hole in the safe body that the split pin from the hinge assembly on the door was placed. So here's a little hole here. And on the other side that you can't see here is a little hole. And on the next, I'll just show you on the next slide. Here's the door and you can see at one end, there's a pin that protrudes from the hinge and at the other end as well. So it slots into those two little holes. So you can see that the holes, there's some damage to the holes but not an excessive amount of damage. This bracket is, uh, this is where the throw from the locking mechanism would have come up against. And you can see that there's, there's a, a little bit of scraping damage, but there's not total deformation in this area at all. So this flange was located approximately an inch from the edge of the safe and the door rests against it when it's in the closed position. And when the door, when the door is, you can see that here's the hinge, the hinge is on the top surface, if you remember. So the door is recessed about an inch inside the body. So imagine trying to stick something in between a seam that is maybe an, uh, one and a half millimeters thick or wide and trying to pry this door open. I don't want to spoil it for you, so I'm not going to keep talking about that, but you are going to see in a second. Um, so here's an overall front of the, of the safe door and the deformation on the hinge assembly. So this hinge assembly was actually pried away from the door at the top and the bottom, as, uh, as you can see in the photograph. And so here you can see that it's been pried away. Now, if you recall, there was only a little bit of deformation right here. So when I saw the very limited deformation here and we have the door resting against this, uh, this flange piece and we have that much deformation here and here, it seemed odd to me. There, there wasn't enough space. Spatially, what I was seeing wasn't making sense for the safe to have been pried like this with the door in the closed position. So uh, here we are, you can see that there are some scratches on the hinge assembly and that the damage to the safe body, uh, once we positioned it, the only way that we could determine, I'm actually holding this hinge assembly up. So here's the safe body. And that's how we've got some deformation right here to this edge. We have some deformation right here to this surface. So something was a pry bar was placed in between these two parts in this space while they tried to pry this, but you can see that that damage only lines up when the doors open. So this was an attempt by 
a colleague of the insured to try and pry the safe door. They tried first to pry it open with the when it was closed, but they actually were unable to break into the safe. So they had to open the safe door using the combination and then pry the door off with the door in the open position in order to make it look like the safe had been broken into. So what have we learned? Um, so big boys make mistakes. <laughs> I don't remember this being here. Uh, we have to go through the entire investigation to get to the end and not skip straight to the end. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Thank you so much, Michelle. So folks, if you don't mind, um, you could submit your questions uh, here. All right, first question is, how did the brackets being installed incorrectly result in a fire? The brackets. Oh, it didn't. It didn't result in a fire. It was, uh, they were looking at a sister, uh, they were looking at a sister trailer when they realized that uh, the bracket that the brackets, they had looked at the entire fleet and discovered that all of their fleet, they were all installed incorrectly. Cool. Okay, I have another one here. For a combine engine compartment fire, there's often the requirement to have, a, to have fire extinguishers on hand in case of an engine fire. Can you tell upon inspection how quickly an extinguisher was used on the fire to determine close on hand or had to go to a different location then come back and use it. So that sounds like a bit of a timeline question. So yes, we are able to see the extent of fire damage and we are able to see whether powder, extinguisher powder is present or not, but we cannot tell if but we cannot tell during the timeline of the fire when the extinguisher was applied. So I can't, I mean, perhaps if there's, um, I was gonna say, even if there was an extinguisher holder on board or not, that wouldn't make a difference. Some people just have them loose under their seats or they stick them somewhere. So I guess the answer, the short answer is no, we can't tell you a timeline. Okay, cool. I guess, more, I guess it's safe to assume that if an extinguisher is on hand very close and the person, the operator knows where the extinguisher is, it would be safe to assume that the fire damage would be less. But I guess you, you perhaps really so it, assume, right? Uh, not always. So, for example, a smaller fire is going to be more easily extinguished than a fire that has developed. So if an engine compartment fire starts and they're able to extinguish it really quickly when it's small, that's great. However, if it's an, let's say for example, it's an electrically started fire in the engine compartment, they can extinguish it. But if they don't disconnect the batteries and disconnect the power, it will continue to arc and it can potentially continue to ignite a fire. That happens quite often. Um, just because you get an extinguisher on a fire in the early stages doesn't always guarantee that you're going to be able to extinguish the fire. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, is the safe case a fraud? Yes. If no one in Canada has the com combination, was the break-in done before they left for Mexico by the owners? In that, in that particular case, it was determined that it, the break-in did occur while the family was in Mexico, but it was colleagues of the family. So it was fraud. Yes. 
but it was done while they were in Mexico. Cool. But that would be outside of your investigation, right? That's Michelle? correct. Like yeah. determining. Yeah. Okay. So, so let's look at it from the perspective of the client. So our client was the insurer. The insurer wasn't interested in laying charges, laying fraud charges. They were interested in whether or not they had to fork out a quarter of a million dollars worth of items that weren't only stolen from the safe. They were also stolen from other places in the home. Yeah. And they only cared, the insurance company only cared about whether or not they paid out. Yeah, it's co and a coverage matter at this point. It was a coverage matter. Yeah. For the increased service intervals on machinery, is it reasonable to expect the owner to be aware of the increased frequency of servicing? I don't really recall any dealerships advising the owners of this unless the unit is brought in for service to the dealer. So I think it depends on the interaction between the owner of the ag equipment and the dealer. So it would depend on the technician. It would depend on if the servicing to the ag equipment was being done in the field or if it was being done at the dealership. If it's taken to a dealer, how engaged is the insured? Does the insured just have it floated there and then just pays the bill and never has a discussion? Do they sometimes put the notes right on the invoice, for example, but maybe the insured takes it home and never reads the invoice? I think a lot of it has to do on the individual dealers and the individual equipment owners. Great, thank you. If the safe entry, the, the, safe, the safe case study is actually really interesting and it seems like a lot of people have a lot of questions about it. Um, if the safe entry was fraudulent, would the same incident also involve a fraudulent attempt to conceal the alarm system history on the home? I don't remember the alarm system aspect. Um, I remember that Mazen had to do an assessment of the alarm system and I, I truthfully don't remember. That was, it was 15 years ago. Okay, cool. Next question. Um, sorry, I'm just reading very quickly. So there's a question about the safe again and the fact that there was kind of their colleagues had had uh, been involved. Did the colleagues obtain the code without the homeowner knowing? Or uh, again, this kind of goes outside of your mm -hmm. technical investigation. It's so yeah, ideas. exactly. Like for me, the for me, my job was to determine if the safe was broken into or if it was. Uh, I determined that the damage to the safe most of the damage to the safe was done with the door in the open position. And then the lawyers took my yes. finding and moved forward with my technical findings. Yes, I think it's it's just an interesting case study. It's um, very interesting. <laughs> and especially from especially from an adjusting standpoint, you know, the, the questions you guys are asking very much are relevant when it comes to to, to how you would administer the claim. Mm -hmm. But Michelle and, uh, and forensic experts in general have to very much have a tunnel vision to stay focused on the technical facts and only, only express opinions on the physical evidence, really. Um, and we can't really talk about liability um, be, really, because that's more of a legal aspect. Mm -hmm. um, you can perhaps document through statements, Michelle, correct me if I'm wrong, you can document through statements as to what people, you know, if, if someone were to have witnessed someone walking in and out of the house or whatever, you can document those things. But that's, that, that's probably the extent of you being able to indicate names or any parties involved. Is that right? That's correct. Cool. Very cool. Okay, I've got I've got another um, 
<laughs> I've got a great question here. So what's a better way to break into a safe? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay. Um, don't. <laughs> don't answer that question. Okay. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, I, I do get asked quite often, how can I set a fire and not get caught? <laughs> I guess that's along the same lines. Yeah, I can't, yeah. I, I'm not permitted to disclose that information. <laughs> that's funny. Is there any information you can give that would serve as an indicator on the EGR fire that would result in calling you? Sorry, um, say that, ask the question again. So is there any information that you can give that would serve as an indicator that uh, on the EGR fire that, so I think what they're asking is, Little hints that something's going wrong prior to the fire yeah. happening. Yes. Then, so I can tell you some of the complaints of the vehicle's performance. So a loss of power, um, a loss of coolant. They'll they'll find that their coolant is dropping lower, and they keep having to add coolant. They'll find sometimes that their heater isn't working properly because they're losing coolant. So the 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 warm coolant then can't get to the heat exchanger that's in the dash. So those, I would say the loss of power, loss of coolant and uh, loss of heat in the cabin. Those are the three main complaints typically that we find. Okay. Um, another thing to point out folks is uh, whenever you have a suspicion about something or even you get a claim that you're scratching your head about please feel free to email us. Um, you can email either myself or even our general box, which is info, <clears throat> excuse me, info at origin-and-cause.com. And just pose whatever question you have. It's not like we open a file for us to answer questions to you. Um, no, and then they, like whoever gets those will forward that email to the appropriate person yes. based on what you have in the body of the email. Yes, well, those usually land on, those emails come to my inbox and, and a, a triage group. So any questions that you guys have, please feel free to pick up, just send an email or even pick up the phone and uh, reach out to us and, and we will put you in contact with the right person to kind of guide you. A lot of times your questions are really um, on the ball. Your instincts are, are really right. And we're able to guide you through those kind of preliminary steps of your investigations or your claims. Um, a lot of times it doesn't result in a investigation for us and, and we're perfectly fine with that. So long as we know that you guys are on the right track and, and you know, you are not, you know, getting yourself in a situation of spoliation of evidence or, you know, just approving coverage of something that perhaps required more investigation. Um, those are things that we deal with all the time and, and we very much encourage customers to just give us a call and just have a discussion with us before you pull the trigger on things. I have another one here. In the combine case, was the claim subrogated against the manufacturer who acknowledged the inadequate lubrication recommendations for the damaged unit? It's, uh, it's, it hasn't even hit litigation. We've only done a report. Cool. at this point okay cool so that is all the questions that have been submitted perfect um, so thank you so much michelle appreciate your time oh my pleasure it, yeah, and, it was a lot of fun <laughs> yes and um also just wanted to thank you all for joining us this year in the national tour this actually concludes the national tour we're ending slightly early um and uh, we will be sending out a questionnaire to get your feedback. We really would appreciate if you guys take a couple of minutes to answer the, the, the questionnaire for us. We will be sending out completion certificates next week, most probably at the tail end of the week. So uh, we appreciate your patience for that. It takes a ton of work for us to um, get those completion certificates organized and, and actually completed and shipped out to you. So. Um, uh, please bear with us in, in that process. And if you do have any questions, you give us, you send me an email anytime. Um, happy to answer your question. You can email marketing at origin and cause.com. Thank you all for joining us this year. And we hope next year you tune in online or we can hopefully see you 
uh, in person. Oh, gee, everybody, that would be good. Yeah, that would be great, eh? Everybody stay safe out there and have a great afternoon and evening.